The Lord be with you. And good morning. Welcome to our online service here for June the 11th. We're into the season after their Pentecost, the time of the church. Uh, may the Lord bring great, great mercy and peace and grace into your life through his word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to seek and to save the lost. Graciously open our ears and our hearts to hear his call and to follow him by faith, that we may feast with him forever in his kingdom. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the prophet Hosea, chapters 5 and 6. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle and the basis for our sermon this morning is from Romans. Chapter 4, St. Paul writes, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are be to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter, glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came 
and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came to call not the righteous, but sinners. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and from his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, dear ones, what can I say? With Holy Trinity Sunday behind and green now adorning the altars of churches in the world, we've officially entered the time of the church. Having focused on, on all that Jesus did, we now continue growing in all that he taught. Which means that from now until mid-September, we will hear epistle readings that take us through the whole book of Romans. It's going to be what I like to call a summer of romance, as we let St. Paul teach us the best stuff in the faith. Luther said, the book of Romans is like an introduction to the Old Testament. You really should read it. God has only revealed two things there. His wrath against all unrighteousness and his promise of salvation from that unrighteousness. Lutherans call this law and gospel. And St. Paul is a master of it. We're catching up with him here in chapter 4 today. But so far, he's been responding to those who claim the gospel has no power. That it is a denial and rejection of the righteousness of God. Because where's the judgment? God threatened wrath. His opponents grumble. How could salvation have come when God's people continue to suffer and evildoers increase their evil ways? Paul was most clear in chapter 1. The threat remains. God's wrath is being revealed and will be revealed in full against all unrighteousness. Fear the Lord. But that's not all. He has also fulfilled his promise of salvation in Christ. His full wrath was poured out on Jesus in the place of the whole world, saving us from it. And now he freely offers us his own righteousness as our victory over sin, death, and the devil. Love the Lord. Trust the Lord. But what about the day-to-day? -day? Paul's opponents grumbled and pushed. Why aren't we experiencing the salvation? Because it is a matter of faith. As the announcement goes out to all the world, Paul confirmed in chapter 3. The new relationship with God is receiving righteousness and life from him by faith. It is trusting his promise that he forgives you in Christ. That he is being true to his word and faithful to all he said of old. Christians are still going to suffer. Life is a struggle. But the one with faith in Christ lives every day in hope because of the question that Paul is asking and answering today in chapter 4. Who will inherit the world? <laughs> 
What an incredible thing to be considering this morning. Who will inherit the world? Because when you look around sometimes, it seems like it will be the greedy, the powerful, and the proud. Well, Paul has already shown that won't be in chapter 1. Ah, but the law-minded, Paul's opponents, those calling for wrath and judgment, they imagine that it will be the commandment keepers, the good boys and girls, the adherents of the law that will receive the inheritance. But St. Paul has already shown in chapter 3, that there are none. The law says no one is righteous. No, not one. The Father's going to give the whole world away as an inheritance. But who's in the will? It is here that Paul is going to make two points today. Number one, God promised the world to Abraham and his seed, not through the law, but through faith. And number two, we are heirs by faith, ungodly beggars who are counting on the promise of grace. Okay, his first point, number one, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. <laughs> this is so fantastic. Paul says, look, it's not that Abraham was a good boy, so God made him a promise. No, it was God's promise that brought Abraham into a posture of faith, the posture of a beggar. And through that beggar hand, through that faith, God kept giving more promises and their fulfillments. Abraham didn't earn the promise. God's promise created faith in him. This is an important distinction, Paul says, because the law did not lead to inheriting the world, but to transgression, knowledge of sin and wrath. We don't experience the law as salvation because it reveals our sin to us. It accuses us and seizes our conscience with guilt. We experience the law of God as him holding a demanding claim over us. It feels uncertain and hopeless and makes us feel unworthy. But God never intended for us to earn the inheritance by the law as if that were possible. No, he made us a promise. He wants us to trust him with our guilt. What are we doing then when we try to earn the inheritance by the law? Well, you're emptying, emptying the promise, Paul says. You're taking the power away from God's promise and putting it in yourself and your work, as though by your busy hands, your work, you will somehow prove to the Father that he should give his inheritance to his best employee at work and not his own dear child who trusts him. This is madness. Worse than that, for where our works and achievements are involved, there is always the question of whether we've done enough. Those who believe salvation comes by the law rob themselves of peace and certainty. No, this was not the way that Abraham related to God, Paul says. God's promise came to Abraham through faith through empty hands. Do you hear that? God gives the world to those who humbly trust his promise of salvation by faith alone, by grace alone. Empty hands are filled with promise. The faith of Abraham is like beggar hands held up to God in hopeful expectation. God wants to give. He's a giver and all of it undeserved and unconditional. Promise, grace, faith, justification, vindication, life. What did Jesus say? The meek shall inherit the earth. Those believing in the God who justifies the ungodly will in the beggary of faith turn to God their gracious king and in meek dependence of faith inherit the earth. 
That's point number one from Paul. The inheritance comes through faith, not law. And now point number two. We too are heirs by faith. Ungodly beggars who are counting on the promise of grace who will inherit the world. Paul quotes Genesis. When God told Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. Like, it's a done deal, Abraham. You are the father of all. The great irony being that Abraham had no children when God spoke this promise to him. This promise was not merely about a biological family. It was about a family of faith. God wasn't just promising him physical children, but those who would believe like him. He is the father of all believers, and all believers from all nations are his seed, heirs of the promise made to him, heirs of the world. How? By the same beggarly faith that trusts in the promise. Jew, Gentile, biology doesn't matter. What matters is faith. We're so earthly and fleshly that we struggle to see beyond biology, Paul says. But Abraham hoped beyond hope. What does that mean? He had God's gift of hope that is above mere earthly hope. Hope as high as the heavens are above the earth. His hope was not in himself. Paul says he was clear-eyed about his impotence. He was a hundred years old. He placed no trust in his self, his body, or his strength. Yes, <laughs> you're supposed to giggle here. It's hilarious. God is playing fun with us as he shows us how much higher his way is than ours. A hundred years old man? With his 90-year-old barren wife? <sighs> this is the whole point. Abraham believed in spite of what he saw. He remembered the one who was making the promise. The one who calls the dead to life. Who calls into being things that are not. Who justifies the ungodly. Who calls the unbeliever to faith. You realize what this means? It means that we are free to laugh at ourselves, to laugh at our impotence, to acknowledge how silly it is for us to act like we can do it. God calls us to have a sense of humor about ourselves. For God's power came to Abraham by faith in spite of all the earthly weaknesses. God's power is made perfect in weakness. And God's power enters your life in the same way, through humble faith. When you see yourself as a helpless, impotent beggar, holding up empty hands, then God is your strength. You trust him, despite what you see. And he promises the world to you. And his promise is enough for now. What an incredible thing. You have the same faith as Abraham. You will inherit the world. Yours is heaven's inheritance, the life of the age to come. Paul has made his two points. He has proclaimed the power of the gospel. One, that God promised his, this world to Abraham and his seed, not through the law, but through faith. And two, that we too are heirs by faith, ungodly beggars, counting on the promise of grace. So get ready. Paul's going to keep going all summer. For what is it that gives God honor and glory? Not when we trust in our works, but when we believe his promise, when we trust that he is able and willing to save by grace, when we count on him to be our righteousness, declaring us right with him by the shed blood of Jesus and nothing else. Yes, his word alone. In the name of Jesus, amen.
May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the life everlasting. Time for prayer. Imagine being able to pray in the confidence Paul has just declared. So let us do that. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all the world according to their needs. We're going to particularly today be praying for Jordan and Cheryl, Eileen and Lois, those in hospital. I, I visited with a few of them this past week, uh, but also for uh, Lutheran Church of the Redeemer and her need for a preacher to proclaim this message of grace. So let us pray together. O oh Lord, you strike down and you heal. Though we justly deserve your wrath for our sin. Revive us and raise us up, that we may live before you forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you desire steadfast love and that your people would know you. Bless pastors, teachers, and all church workers, that your word would sound forth in abundance. Grant a preacher to Lutheran Church of the Redeemer in your good timing, and open the ears of all who hear to acknowledge your steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, by your grace, Abraham did not weaken in faith, but trusted your promises. Strengthen parents to persist in their callings and train their children in your word and ways. Defend them from discouragement and apathy. and Convince them that you are able to do what you have promised. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator of all things, you called into existence what does not exist and govern it for good. Remember those who have given authority among the nations, that the laws they administer might reflect your order and maintain peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your Son came to heal the sick and forgive sinners. Hear our prayers for those who suffer in any way, including Jordan, Lois, Eileen, Cheryl, and those we name before you in our hearts. Restore them according to your gracious will, and strengthen their faith in your faithfulness and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, you made childless Abraham the father of many nations, when his body was as good as dead, giving him faith to trust in the promised Christ. Strengthen our faith also to trust your promises, despite our weaknesses and troubles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, your Son ate with sinners to call them into righteousness, and now feeds us in his supper that we might be forgiven. Prepare our hearts to partake of the sacrament of the altar with penitence and faith, and so depart in righteousness and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Father, receive our thanks for your kindness to Abraham, Sarah, and all the saints who have gone before us. Preserve us in faith and in righteousness that we too may give you glory now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Well, dear ones, 
call on the one who calls the dead to life and things into being that were not. He works this way. He has given you faith so that you might trust him and call on him like your father Abraham. God bless you in that. See you next time.